Without a doubt, Industrial Light and Magic is the premier visual effects house in the world. Every single scene of Revenge of the Sith had at least one effect, and many shots had dozens and dozens of elements. The lightsaber duel was a huge challenge. ILM had to take footage shot on green screen stages and make it appear to have been shot on a real location, a volcanic planet that really only exists in George's imagination. The visual effects producers at ILM, led by executive producer Denise Rehm, supervise all the production coordinators, the assistants, the managers who make sure that the myriad of effects departments working on the sequences come together smoothly and on budget. There's probably 150 people working on this one sequence. It's another production happening with the same scope and scale as the live action crew. So this time, when we open the main gate, we want to try to find a, a height and just hold it there, right? OK, thank you. You know, once I saw the storyboards and the animatics, I began formulating a plan of who I actually wanted to work on the film. John Knoll worked as long as possible by himself to create the visual effects for the film. When we decided to add a second supervisor, Due to my relationship with Roger, we thought he would be a really great addition to the team. I was very excited to be involved with Mustafar. It, was, it sounded fantastic and it looked a real challenge. I mean, there's a large piece of work, lots of technical things, but also I just liked the look of it. While I sort of oversee the crew, Nina and Janet handle the day-to-day -day production management of the sequence. Um, this is a list of shots we have turned over so far. Mm -hmm. So you can take a look at those specifically and a list of just this is from the ranch okay. with all the shots. And this afternoon we have the Mustafar meeting to go over uh, the miniature shoot to try to kind of just do a miniature shoot turnover. Yeah. 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 Some more stuff for you guys to look at here. Thank you. For the volume of work at Isle and we have several producers and several people in each position and we just run our own house from start to finish. It's, we oversee the production of many, many artists. It's, uh, it's it's quite a uh, logistical puzzle um, to try and figure out how you're going to get everything through the pipeline. People commonly refer to us as runners. We do a lot of running around. Um, we're basically the gophers of the crew. Uh, we do a lot of administrative office responsibilities, a lot of copying of scripts, um, copying of documentation. We set up a lot of the reviews and set up the dailies between the visual effects supervisors and the artists. We also are responsible for setting up the reviews between uh, the visual effects supervisors and George uh, over in the theater. Whoa. It's mind-boggling how much work goes into this movie. Creatively, all of ILM's efforts are led by the visual effects supervisors. John was on the movie from the very beginning, working with George in the art department to create the whole master plan of Mustafar. We have to sort of editorially put this set together somehow. But right now it's, I mean, we have the, the model and we know what we're doing, but it's still pretty big. While I'm here, I, I'm working on a variety of things. You know, the, the main thing to do is to try and maintain quality control on blue screens and make sure we're collecting enough information to replicate the cameras later. And they go through the... Uh, George is very technically savvy and his first instinct is pretty much exactly right. Um, but a lot of times there are novel situations that come up that require some consultation. So he'll ask, should we shoot it this way or this way? The one that's the more important is this one anyway, because it's the one that's got the most set in it. Well, the big challenge in Mustafar is, is lava, and there's lots of it, and it's at lots of different scales. Roger had a less enviable task. He came midway through the planning to supervise the actual production. Once Roger came on, it was, it was actually a big relief to, OK, I'm not going to think about Mustafar anymore. Now it's in good hands. At least the stuff that, uh, that sprays up and glops over the arm to, to melt it, that's all going to have to be. be done as a CG thing. So that's something we've already started doing, is it, John? John Knoll essentially handed what information he had about the background of the sequence to me when I joined the show. And, and obviously, that's a fairly daunting moment, because John is so much more familiar with the whole Star Wars process. But there is that moment on the show where you sort of think, my god, what have you got yourself into? Hey, Craig, how are you? Good. John and Roger also supervised hundreds and hundreds of people in many different ILM departments, each of whom had one specific task. You have to understand, sometimes you'll have an artist working on a shot, a three-second shot, for literally months at a time. 
The match movers work to make sure that everyone who's associated with each shot has the visual reference points. That's an incredibly important job because a huge amount of our shooting is done against completely featureless blue and green screen. Whenever you want to uh, do any kind of a 3D visual effect, be it uh, CG uh, 3D element that you want to add or a miniature element from a motion control camera on stage, you need to accurately recreate the perspective um, and the, the camera angle um, of the shot as it was photographed originally. In blue screen, it's very easy to get lost. It's very easy to you know, move the camera and pan the camera or dolly or do things and not know exactly where on the fabricated set that will be there you are. So you need little markers and things in the blue screen and there's a person whose job it is to make sure that those markers are in the right place. As, as we go around, we'll have X's on one side, Y's on another, and then Z's, and try to break it up so that we have a really fast whip pan that can see about where we are. As the coverage gets tighter and tighter, sometimes we're into to some pretty tight you know, just a head and shoulders against the screen. If and there's just nothing but an actor in blue screen, we'll want to make sure that there's some kind of reference that tells us what, what's panning and tilting. These are, these are emergency track lights that we use when uh, we go in real tight and we can't see any of the other plastic markers that are up on the walls. Um, by uh, putting these track markers up, we can, we can see how the cameras are panning around and, and, and what's happening behind the actors so that we can uh, reproduce the camera move with the proper background. So using the information that, that Jason uh, gathered while he was on location in Sydney, we use sophisticated um, tracking software to recognize the X, Y's, and Z's that Jason was placing, the, the targets that he put on the green screen. But we then took uh, the various measurements, uh, photographs, camera reports, lens information, all of the stuff that he took uh, while he was down there, and we basically rebuilt that into uh, a virtual environment with a virtual camera move that was an exact replica of exactly what the camera move was on location. Once the original match move is completed and we, and we incorporate it into the, to the virtual environment, we can basically resize them to any size we want to and still maintain perspective that actually makes sense and allowing uh, George quite a few more options towards, towards what, he, what the final shot should look like. We then hand that off to, to the other departments further down um, where they will replace this kind of game res version of, of the Mustafar buildings with the final high res version. One of my favorite groups is the animation department, and they're led by Rob Coleman. He's responsible, he and his team, for creating the digital characters. He has to bring them to life and make them so believable that they can interact seamlessly with our live actors. There's uh, 2,146 effect shots in the film. We animated 1,269 shots. Myself and others felt that it was really important that we get that, the feeling of that scale, of that huge thing hitting and impacting. And one of the ways to achieve that was to see it rocking, but then also to add the digital stuntman on top of that, reacting and, and falling and holding on for dear life, honestly. They're fully animated. There's no motion capture in this particular shot. I kind of exaggerated it because I knew it would be fairly small on screen and all you'd really see would be the little uh, blue lightsabers kind of flashing around. So it had to be a broader motion than it would be if you were looking at it up close. It's maybe not the most glamorous sort of shot to do for an animator because if we do our job right, then they, people shouldn't really know it's animated. The digital environment and matte painting groups apply their artistry with computers to create entire virtual worlds, often incorporating footage we've shot in the real world, like the eruption of Mount Etna in Italy. We're taking all of those pieces and, you know, extracting lava, extracting smoke, combining those with computer-generated images and coming up with really nice stuff. And essentially, it's a giant backdrop and it's going to be used for the entire Mustafar sequence. So I needed something to start with. And I actually had kind of an idea just driving to work one day, and that was uh, I was driving past the gravel parking lot, the overflow parking lot here at ILM, and I photographed some stills of the gravel parking lot. And you can kind of see it there if we zoom in really close. And that sort of became the beginnings of the lava ocean. And once I finished the painting, then it became time to animate it. As you can see here, 
I've gone through and moved all the clouds as well as all of the lava ocean. It took me probably several months to actually complete the final 25,000 pixel wide painting. If one person was working on it in a linear time frame, it would probably take him two or three years to get that work done. The technical directors, their primary task is to light a 3D scene. That means not only lighting the objects, but creating shadows and reflections too. It's all these uses of lighting in a CG world that make it feel real and bring it to life on the screen. We have actually two things to do. It's the lighting on it, and also the interaction with the lava, the 3D CG lava that we're gonna do. What you can see here, for instance, it's like the light is moving slightly, and that's, that was to give this feeling of the flow of the lava, so the lava doesn't have the same intensity everywhere. Also, because the lava is underneath, you want to have something that is probably brighter uh, at the bottom and darker at the top. The lighting is important because that's what will give the shape and the density and the feeling and the mood. The lighting process will take probably about two, three weeks of work. Then the simulation, the particles and stuff like that will take probably about a, a month. There was a mixture of geysers. Uh, some of the geysers were footage that we put into place from Mount Edna and also elements that we shot on our back lot, methicil. So here's an example of uh, methicil being uh, shot out of a high-pressure hose. In some cases, we were able to use the elements that we shot. In other cases, we had to generate them uh, in CG. We, we treat each ball as though it were a little density field with a high density in the middle and, and falling off to, to zero density at the outside. What we end up with is a surface. We can also use all those points as tiny little light sources to get all of the, the interaction with the, the rest of the set. And from here on, it, it's really just a case of, of layering up the detail. So I, I add on steam and sparks, secondary lava events in the background, debris raining down on the set. The other little detail that you can see here, but which really helps sell the final shot, is that we're getting some reaction from the arm itself. It actually bows and, and buckles as the lava hits it. This shot was a really strange one to work on. This was the original miniature element that we shot. We're actually looking down the river of lava and we're following the, the path of the arm. Unfortunately, it turned out that George had conceived the shot differently. He actually saw it as a reverse angle shot, looking back up the river, watching the arm floating down towards us. By the time we realized this, we'd actually dismantled the set. And the solution that we came up with was to, first of all, flip the plate round horizontally, run it backwards, and here you can see I've got something that just about works. Unless you look really closely and you'll notice that the waterfalls are actually going up. It took me about two days to notice this. I felt really, really stupid. I was sitting there in dailies and, and somebody just said, ah, aren't the lava falls going up? Um, sure enough, they are. Here I've done a little bit more work. I've, I've got some more buildings in. I've got some interaction going on between the, the plate and the arm. One take later, you can see that we've now actually managed to get the lava falls going the right way. We've added in some background sky and, and layers of, of more stuff in from the Mount Etna footage and a little bit more and we, we get to the, the final shot. The CG modelers and the view paint technicians are the digital equivalent of a construction team. They build and texture each and every single item and every single frame that we see. This particular model took us about, I'd say, uh, three to five weeks. We uh, really decked this thing out for the shots because we knew we were going to see it like really close and then we had to break the model. So what we had to do is build stuff inside the model after we break it off as well. So this is where the break point is. We added some bent pipes and stuff that goes into the model so that when, you, when it breaks off there's, there's actually stuff inside. And then we also built a lot of details that you probably don't see very much but you'll probably miss it if it's not there. You know, they really do give it their heart and soul. And a movie like this couldn't be done without that kind of attitude. Digital technology has completely revolutionized the visual effects industry. But sometimes nothing beats the old fashioned use of models and miniatures. And we don't always look to the future, we often look back. 
ILM has a substantial practical modeling group, which was instrumental in creating the Mustafar seeds. Oh, permission to come aboard? Yes. It's all yours. Lava is quite a difficult thing to do inside a computer. A physical model, you can build it, you can look at it, and you can light it, and it behaves in a kind of control, a very controllable way. And then the, the big structure that holds the control arms is uh -huh. here. The organic nature of Mustafar and sort of the, the rock lava planet enabled us to build it fairly quickly. The material itself breaks in a way like rocks do. does that, that kind of thing. You can take this tool, but eventually you can make it look like a mountain. The whole set is uh, tilted at 10 degrees, and it tilts much like a uh, wheelbarrow, so that we can adjust the angle of it depending on how fast we want the flow. Most of the time for Mustafar went into developing the lava and the lava crust. Essentially, it's you're using a methicil, which is a food additive, and you're coloring it and underlighting it so that you have a perspex base to the river, because obviously lava emits light. And then the other thing was just the speed that the lava moved at. I looked at a lot of reference, and actually it moves at any speed you want it to. George felt initially the same way as I felt, that it should be moving slower. But when I showed him the two side by side, we straight away we were in agreement it should be moving quickly because it just is so much more exciting. Motion control enables us to capture an environment with a camera move that can be exactly repeated over and over again. Just as in live action, we choose lenses, camera angles, filters, lighting, and effects like smoke, all to create and capture exotic worlds like Mustafar that don't exist in real life. Sometimes it's a little more effective to go heavier smoke, so I'm just judging it by eye as I go through, and, and that's kind of the beauty of HD, is you, you see what you're going to get as you're shooting it. It's working out great. It's really giving it some more depth and scale. What we do is we light it in different ways and we photograph it in different ways. So we have these component pieces and because you're shooting it using a motion control rig, each one of the passes actually marries together. So you can mix them together. All these elements create the atmosphere and sort of ambience of the place. ILM's rotoscope department isolates the individual elements from the green screen sets, like the actors and the props, so that they can be removed or added within specific shots. We have very elaborate roto, rotoscope and paint needs for the sequence, and uh, Beth D'Amato is our roto supervisor for the sequence. What was daunting with the Mustafar sequence was actually not so much how the work was done, but the actual quantity of work. One of the tasks that we have is to actually help compositors isolate both of the actors off of this set piece because typically they can extract actors off of a green screen but in this case there were a lot of shadows and the way that their characters incorporated with our CG element it wasn't simple enough to just pull them off of a green screen we had to actually give them matte help so what we do is we actually go in and create what looks like an outline or a cookie cutter shape that says all of these areas need to be isolated and physically pulled off of this element. And on top of that, both actors were carrying lightsabers, so we also had to do additional roto work to comp in lightsaber effects on every single shot. So we do a lot of paint work and we do a lot of matte work that incorporates them into an environment to make it all look real and seamless. The compositing group brings it all together. They come in, they take all the separate elements and seamlessly blend them in to create the final shot. As a compositor, we're basically the last ones in the chain. We get the elements 
from all the different sources, like model elements, miniature elements. We get elements from second unit, people against blue screen, the animation department, and we just combine it all to the final film frame. For this element alone, we have maybe 10 different passes, and we have you know, the lava, we have smoke elements, different smoke elements for the foreground, for the background, and some sparks and some embers. And it's actually a lot of fun to find the right element and, and make it work within your shot. A sequence of this level of complexity takes an, an enormous amount of time and effort from many people that are working long hours. At the end of the day, we're almost finished here, and I still look up there and I can't believe we've done what we've done. Sound works almost subliminally in a movie. In the best case scenario, you aren't even aware of the texture and the combinations of sounds. And yet, the sound designers think about every single shot of the movie from the standpoint of what an audience will hear. This is audio history. I want you all to look alert. Remember, you're marching off to war, so you can be, can be tears. You know, Star Wars is always demanding in terms of uh, orchestrating sound and orchestrating sound effects and dialogue with music. To construct the final sound for a one-minute section of the Mustafar sword fight, it requires work on several levels. First of all, there's just a dialogue. You have quite a few of uh, sword fight vocalizations in this movie, so I don't know if it's better for you to hit those at the end of our session. One of my main responsibilities on the film is, in, is going and supervising all the dialogue, like the re-recording of the actors in the studio. <sighs> what do you think? I mean, we could stand to have some more breaths around that just because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's got to match in your close-up. One of the most detailed of Matt's tasks is supervising what we call the automatic dialogue replacement, or ADR. One of the reasons why we have to re-record a lot of the actors' dialogue that's recorded on the set is that the sounds don't sound realistic. I mean, obviously, the, when they're fighting with those lightsabers, that's the sound of a stick hitting, so you really hear a plastic or a wood hit, you know, and they might be walking on wood, so they're not on stone, and so those, all those sounds come through to the microphone, and so when they're breathing and talking, you get all these clicks and clacks. So we have to go back, and the actor has to generate that energy again. And hopefully, you're getting performances that were better than what they recorded originally, originally on the set. 1,600 grunts and groans. Or why don't we just stand here and you can slap me silly and then you can just fit yeah. in where uh, you need to. Uh, oh. uh, ah, 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 George, ah. The next layer of sound was the foley, which are the footsteps and the movement. And although you may not hear a lot of that consciously, it's very important to have that there to give it a naturalness. There was the full-time Foley artist on this film, and then there were two other walkers. Basically, what, what our job is, is to really flesh out the characters. So this is what we used for Anakin, for his movement, for to kind of sell his menacing character. <clears throat> we're using an old, just a black leather jacket that has some good creaks. We have an old rifle for some of the metallic-y sounds. And then this old drill, actually, too, has some nice kind of sounds that we put up against it. So this all together is Anakin's sort of presence and gear. Then you get to the actual sound effects that I design. In addition to being one of our editors, Ben Burt designs both the overall sound experience and also specifically the environmental sounds. The swords really don't make sound. There's really no lava. All of that has to be given weight and credibility with the sounds. Let's look at the sequence now in terms of what's really there, in terms of sound effects. Throughout this entire fight, there's an erupting volcano. So there's a roar in the back, and that roar is composed of uh, wind, thunder that's been recorded at other times. And then there's the bubbling of all the lava. So we notice in the lava flow in Mustafar that there's these popping bursts of lava in the flowing river of lava. So I wanted to um, take some explosions. Actually, there are sounds of uh, artillery mortars firing. I'm going to mix that with a little bit of uh, liquid water sound and uh, blend the two together. And then we'll have a new effect, which we can ship downstairs and uh, begin to cut it in really quickly. <laughs> and these liquid effects were produced here at, at uh, Skywalker Ranch by putting a shovel into the mud and squeezing it uh, and rotating it to make various bursts of mud fly in the air. 
Now I'm going to take those sounds and put them on a keyboard so I can play them. So there's really an array of different notes being played, all of them in the realm of uh, continuous explosions, but with some character to them. All the sound design elements are layered together in preparation for the final mix. Tom Myers works with Ben Burke on this monumental task. This takes months and months of work. As the effects editor and the effects mixer, what I'm doing is cutting the sound effects and mixing as I go. For this session, this is Volcano Eruption B, which is effect number 379 that Ben has made. So just for that one scene, we have tracks and tracks of material that, uh, that we go through. And at this stage, what we're doing is balancing them against each other. And then we will go to the mix room and then take our balanced sound effects and put them against the balanced dialogue and the music and then balance those against each other. Without the sound designers, the lightsabers wouldn't hum, the lava wouldn't roar, you wouldn't hear the dialogue, and the duel would be a lot less exciting. So their job is so incredibly important to the overall movie. The sound effects um, need to play up the reality of lots of things. It's important in the film that if something happens, there's an appropriate sound associated with it. But also the music is the element which is abstract and can go right to the heart. 